morning and welcome to worship. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. We wor worship virtually with the assurance that the church is not just a building, but more importantly, the church is the people. And we know that when we gather together in Jesus' name, Jesus is in our midst. Next Sunday, we are excited to announce that we are going to be having a live outdoor worship at 4 p.m. on the grounds of the Narrow Passage Inn, thanks to the hospitality of Ellen and Ed Markle. Please bring with you a plant or some flowers or stones or something else from your yard or your home, because all together, individually, as we arrive, and safely distance, we are going to create our altar arrangement that morning. We also ask that you would bring your own lawn chairs, insect repellent, an umbrella, that will mean we, it won't rain, and face masks, because we will be maintaining safe practices, including social distancing guidelines. And I want to let you know and assure you that we are, it's sad, but to assure you sadly, that we are not going to sing, but there will be some music in the service. You'll get a reminder email later this week to remind you about that. And just to let you know that that service will be recorded and it will be available the day after on Monday. There will be no morning worship provided next Sunday the 23rd via our, our um, website. And I ask that you would cl click on the worship bulletin to access the extra music and the children's moment that go with this service and please ignore any youtube commercials that might come up with the music we aren't promoting anything except for jesus and the church and in this time of covid everyone's gifts are so welcome your gifts of time your gifts of love and any gifts that you can share with us and those around us for uh, with your money we realize that a lot of people are hurting financially and we don't expect everyone to be able to give or to give as generously as perhaps they have in the past. But if you are able to give, please take advantage of using our website where you can donate directly through Realm, which has very little overhead for the church or PayPal, PayPal, which has a little bit more overhead for the church or send it the old fashioned way by writing a check and putting it in an envelope and sending it to the church. And now I ask that you would join with me in prayer. The Bible tells us this in the Psalms, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like a summer rain which restores the parched earth. It is like a cool breeze at the shore of a lake, at the top of a mountain, or even through a crowded city street. When we have gathered to worship the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives. And so we pray and ask you, maker of our days, you who created each of us as unique beings with different strengths and weaknesses. Help us not only to use our strengths to assist others, but also to allow others to use their strengths to meet our weaknesses. Restorer of our soul. You have seen the parched places we have made in our lives, along with the devastation, devastation that has been thrust upon us by action or inaction of others. And so we ask that you would meet us in the places of our deepest pain so that our facades of self-sufficiency might fall away and we might be drawn into right relationship with you and one another. Fill us with your presence, invigorate our worship, set us on fire so that others might be drawn into your light and nurtured by the warmth of your loving care. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Today's scripture is Matthew 15, verses 10 through 28. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if one blind person guides another, both will fall into the pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Many thanks to Patty Dellinger for the scripture reading, for Emily Kuhn for the anthem, and Mary Catlett who makes our music selections. Your help is invaluable to us. I recently read a book by N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, Pauline theologian, and Anglican bishop, titled God and the Pandemic, a Christian reflection on the coronavirus and its aftermath. It's a short book, but a great read, and I would recommend it. Early in the book, he included this familiar passage that was written by Reverend Martin Niemöller, a German Lutheran pastor, reflecting on the Holocaust and his position and role in the Holocaust. He wrote this, they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. I need to confess that those words pierced my own heart. You see, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and my experience there was that there were many racial, ethnic and religious neighborhoods, some of which best might be described as ghettos. It was okay for me, a Presbyterian of Scottish and German descent, to be best friends with my neighbor Elaine, who was from a devout Roman Catholic family of Polish descent. But it was not okay for my oldest sister to date a Catholic of Italian descent, nor would it have been okay for me to do the same. One time, I remember my best friend and I got on the wrong bus coming back from a Pittsburgh Pirate baseball game at Forbes Field. We were in fifth and seventh grade at the time, not very old at all, but it was in a day when you could ride a bus anywhere. However, this time we ended up lost on the south side of Pittsburgh, a, an African-American inner city neighborhood. We got off the bus when the route ended and we went into a drugstore and I called my father to come and get us 
And he and the rest of my family and her family were appalled and absolutely terrified that we had been in that position. <laughs> I remember later after we moved to Harrisburg in the center of the state and folks from our white side of the Susquehanna River would routinely lock our car doors when we drove across the bridges into the other black side of the river. You remember the old Virginia Slims commercial? They were cigarettes targeted to attract women in the late 1960s. They had this tagline, you've come a long way, baby. I'll give you a bonus point if you want to email me the name of the artist who wrote that song. I have to say, I have come a long way, but I have a long way to go. On March 2nd, 2020, I departed from Cebu in the Philippines, had a quick layover at the former Clark Air Base on the island of Luzon in the Philippines, and then on to Dubai, where I changed airplanes for my final leg to Dulles Airport. When I had left for the Philippines about two weeks earlier, the airports all over the world, and, and certainly in the US and in um, Dubai and in the Philippines, were very full and busy. There were absolutely no health checks at Dulles or Dubai or at Manila. And I was only one of a handful of people on my flights or in the terminals to wear a face mask. But things had changed very quickly in just that period of time. So on March 2nd, with COVID-19 cases spiking in Italy and Korea and Iran having escaped from China, borders were being closed and all kinds of flights were being rerouted. I remember I had such relief when I got through the health screenings in Cebu and noted that my flights were on schedule. Most people had masks in the airports and on the planes. And truth be told, there weren't a lot of people in those planes or in those airports. And when our flight landed at Dulles, I was so relieved. I thought I am home safe. While I loved what I was doing in the Philippines, uh, the, and, and loved that place and I loved the people there, I sure didn't want to run the risk of getting COVID in a third world country. After all, it was an Asian problem, a Chinese problem, an Italian problem, something that was happening to them and not to us. Do you hear those words? Them and us. Talk about my sense of privilege, ethnocentrism, racism, and national pride, all of which is being dismantled over the course of the past six months. That's really what is happening in our text this week. It's happening with the disciples, and so it would seem also with Jesus. This particular event in context occurs after Jesus walk on water, Peter's sinking moment, and Jesus comment to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? In the first portion of this passage, which I asked to have read, Jesus was criticized by those fastidious Pharisees for the comment, it is not what goes into the mouth that makes a person unclean, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. This foreshadows the vision that Peter will have about the clean and the unclean animals and God's invitation to the full banquet of creation, including, I am happy to say, pork and shrimp. In some ways though, the unspoken reality of my childhood was that somehow they were not clean, and we were. Jesus and his disciples traveled far to the north 
to what is now known as current present day Lebanon. And we need to pray for that country and especially for the city of Beirut. For Jesus and his companions, this was foreign territory inhabited by Canaanites. Now Canaanites were the people the Israelites battled and killed when they conquered the promised land. And here in this foreign place, a foreign woman, an unnamed Canaanite woman, caused a disturbance. She cried out, have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But here's the really disturbing part. The Bible tells us Jesus did not answer her at all. The disciples urged Jesus to send her away. <laughs> they tended to do that. They did that with those children that were bothering him as well. But he said, and this is disturbing, I was sent only sent, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the mother kneels at Jesus' feet and begs him, Lord, help me. And Jesus answers, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she replies, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I have struggled with this part of the text. For at first blush, this is not a Jesus that I am fond of. I've wondered in the past if Jesus was having a bad day. For surely everyone can understand that. We all have bad days. Or I wondered if, like us, Jesus' understanding of the expansiveness of God's love wasn't yet fully developed but neither of those feel right to me. And this time around, I have to wonder if maybe Jesus was playing along with both the woman and the disciples. He did the same thing, as you know, in the feeding of the 5,000, not counting, not counting women and children. He said to the disciples, you feed them. Maybe Jesus is giving voice, not so much to his bias, but to what was going through the disciples' minds, playing out their sense of us and them as a perfect learning experience. In our text last week, we heard Jesus say to Peter, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And this week, in response to the woman's words, Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. In this season, with a pandemic and economic crisis, at least for all of us except the very wealthiest who seem to be getting lots of money off a stock market that has been largely influenced by insider trading, in addition to the economic crisis and the political and racial unrest that's unseen, something we haven't seen in our lifetimes, this text gives me pause. And quite frankly, it convicts me in deep ways. First, I am convicted by my notion of scarcity. Um, even as I, I speak, um, this week I sent Rod on an errand to one of those big membership warehouse stores to stock up on items like paper goods. You know, the 15 rolls that we have on hand aren't quite enough. This is scarcity mentality. But the Canaanite woman knew that God is a God of abundance and that there is enough, even for her. There is enough if we share. And certainly there is enough of God's mercy for everyone. Second, I am convicted of my notions of us and them. The Canaanite woman pushed against, confronted, 
and set about dismantling with Jesus the sexist, ethnocentric, religious notions about the world. In a companion text this week, Isaiah 56 right, says this, to the eunuchs, those were people who were sexually different, to the eunuchs and the foreigners who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. If they sound familiar, it's because Jesus proclaimed them over the trading of goods in the temple during the week of his passion. And third, I am convinced that persistence plays a huge role in faith. The Canaanite woman didn't give up. She kept pushing for what was right. And in this trifecta season, we need to persist as well. We need to persist in dismantling our own biases, as painful as that is. We need to persist in pursuing healthy behaviors. We need to persist in sharing out of our abundance. We need to persist in loving others. We need to persist in pursuing justice for all. And we need to pers persist in being the church, not just a building, but the church, the body of Christ. John Lewis, who recently died, said this, faith is being so sure of what the Spirit has whispered in your heart that you believe, and your belief in its eventuality is unshakable. That is the sort of faith that is radical. It's fierce in not letting go. It's persistent faith that not only sustains us, but moves us to act in such a time as this. A foreigner, a them, a woman no less, from a different culture and religion and ethnicity, persisted in seeking mercy for her daughter. And the outcome of that is written right here in this book in both Matthew and in Mark. I feel like the man in Mark who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Let us persist, may it be so, amen. Just a, an announcement about prayer and about some mission opportunities in our church. Later this week, you're going to be receiving information about an initiative from our Stewardship and Missions Committee to support our students, educators, staff, and parents as a new school year is upon us. In addition to investigating options to help with Wi-Fi hotspots and partnering with the worship ministry to provide care packages that were delivered this last week, they are inviting you to sign up to take a day in a, a, one day in the next month to hold in prayer all of those involved in education. And so I invite you to join with me in one of those prayers as we begin this ministry. Let us pray. Lord, we know that you hold the future and that you walk with us even now on this unpredictable path of the pandemic. We trust your work through the most difficult seasons and never abandon us to navigate life's challenges alone. As we look to the new school year, we worry about the ongoing impact of COVID-19. It seems to be a time of no right answers, no clear good choices, and no comprehensive way for parents, educators, and administrators to meet the pressing needs of students, staff, teachers, and families. We do not want children to fall further behind in their learning. We do not want to put caregivers in the position of choosing between going to work 
or tending to their children. And we do not want to endanger the health of any in our community. Already stretched resources are pushed to the limit as we attempt to reduce class sizes, expand the ways content is delivered, and seek to enact needed safety precautions. And so we look to you, Lord, to take and bless and multiply our efforts to ed educate and nurture your children. We look to you, Lord, who gives us the peace that passes understanding, who hears the cries of the hurting and promises that small amounts of faith can precipitate large life-giving change. We look to you, loving God, for wisdom, for courage, for inspiration, for creativity. As we make difficult decisions in an unprecedented time, grant us an unshakable commitment to one another, especially to the most vulnerable among us. Send your spirit to open our eyes to the new thing you are doing. Send your spirit to open our ears to the voices we need most to hear. Send your spirit to open our hearts to the profound love that you have for all of us so that everything we do in this time of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty reveals your compassion, kindness, and grace. Send your spirit to comfort and direct us as we humbly look to you for guidance and strength. And in these next few moments of silence, I invite you to humbly look to God for the guidance and strength, for the joy, for the sorrow that you feel, for all the things that lie heaviest upon your heart. Keep our hearts and minds open for your reconciling word for us. For this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you have been reconciled with Christ. So do the work of Christ in this world. Extend support to those in need. Speak up for those who have been cast aside Build bridges of reconciliation. Strengthen the bonds of community, knowing that the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives will be with you and with all of us this day and evermore. Amen.